The good thing about this being newly emergent land is there's not that many thick roots. Yep. What is that? Silty? Sandy? It's muddier than I expected it to be. So we've got some dark gray. It's Pretty really clay, it's really huh? Clay, yeah, right. Yeah. A lot of the history of coastal Louisiana is buried in the sediments of the marshes that are here. Ooh. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. Hey. And so by looking at the coastal system, we can get a record of the environment. Not a lot of I don't taste any silt. Right hey, that's just clay. As a coastal geologist, I look at how water and mud move across the coast, and I look at how humans alter that process. I guess I, I originally wanted to be an ornithologist. My first job was in the Everglades. I chased swallowtailed kites around and realized that I did not want to spend my scientific career chasing my samples. So I started being a geologist because I realized that the mud didn't move very fast. And hey, I think we're stuck, yeah, so yeah, I'm gonna just Yeah. Let's just see if we can give it. The, the question if you're a scientist that works in shallow water environments is not if you're gonna get stuck, it's how you handle things when you do get stuck. We're fine. We just hit an oyster. Here at Lumcon's Marine Center, one of the really nice things is that we have a seawater system. So just as a bar might have, uh, have beer on tap, we have seawater on tap. A laser diffraction particle size analyzer, we're drying oven, it get out all the water. So in the field the other day, we were tasting sediment, the gamma detector, liquid nitrogen, which I used to keep the detector cool. That's a pretty good qualitative way to do it and burn it to determine the organics. No, I actually have not had many humorous mishaps when tasting samples. I, I've had no shortage of field humor. They were hanging out and I guess we got attacked by it. Mm -hmm fish, yeah. And it was a little boat. But tasting samples was actually not one of them. Nah, there's a little silt in there. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the issues of restoring coastal Louisiana revolve around building land at a rate that is faster than the rate at which we're sinking and water levels are rising. A lot of the substance in New Orleans is a little bit like a sponge. And when the sponge is wet, it expands, and then when it dries out, it compresses into a smaller mass. And part of the reason we're here is we want to understand what the possibility for this area is to compact and sink, and also what that means about how water might flow in the city. Here in South Louisiana, we're sinking at a rate, on average, it's about a centimeter a year. Global sea level rise makes that 1.4 centimeters a year, so about a half an inch a year. Over 10, 12 years, you could easily be looking at six inches worth of sea level rise. Down at a place like Lumcon, Six inches of sea level rise is the difference between a dry parking lot and a flooded parking lot. The marsh buffer that provided flood protection is diminished. This poster was what, 20? When did you make the poster? This 20? is about a year ago. So, the, yeah. so the, the place where we started was looking at these uh, Google Earth images and just looking at the, the visual land change that you can see in Davis Pond. The sediment load in the river, calculating it based on season. A freshwater diversion is a gate in a levee. And the idea of that is to restart the natural land building processes mm -hmm. that originally built the Mississippi River Delta. The delta was built when sediments from continental U.S. were delivered to the coastal landscape 
when it hit the ocean, the flow slowed down, and all of the mud in the muddy Mississippi River settled out. Now, the Mississippi River sits largely behind levees, and so it doesn't bring mud to the coast in the way that it used to. Diversions are designed to mimic that process. How deep is the water, like 10 centimeters or something? Yeah. Like Let's try to get it in one full meter. So we have about 60 centimeters of deposition since the diversion opened. And the diversion opened in 2002. So we're looking at, yeah. An inch and a half or so yeah. a year. Yeah. The diversion packet, we think, maybe even a little thicker over here. What do you think is true? I think there's a lot more trees. I, I think you're right. And if you're talking a meter in, what, 15 years, this was probably open water or quasi-open water, so you had to fill this in high enough that you can get trees there. The projections are that river diversions will build tens to maybe low numbers of hundreds of square miles. They are long-term, one of the more efficient ways to build land. The 2017 master plan has a diversion in this area, right? Yeah, there's there's two. So makes you think it's not a bad area for it. Yeah. But any plan is going to be a series of trade offs. If you brought a diversion into an area, you might change it to a system that was dominated by freshwater species. What does that mean for people that make a living off of like shrimping and oystering? If we're going to think about wetland and coastal restoration, it needs to be a multifaceted process that doesn't just look at wetlands, but also the benefits to people. There were other pushes forward to restore the coast. But post-Katrina was when the state initiated its, its master planning process. The state's coastal master plan is basically a plan to restore ecosystems and provide flood protection for communities across coastal Louisiana. The big difference between the 2012 and the 2017 plan really comes down to the rate of global sea level rise. 2012, the high end of sea level rise was about 1.4 feet over 50 years. And in 2017, the low end of global sea level rise was 1.4 feet. And the high end was 2.7 feet. So the rate of projected sea level rise went up substantially. How you doing? A couple hundred years ago, probably as recently as 100, this bayou in here would have carried fresh water and the trees would have been able to survive. There's basically ghost forests that used to be thriving trees and are now dead. Working here in Cocodry, I know what sea level rise means and the cascading kinds of influences, what it means about how you get to work, about how your car functions, about how your building functions. One study that I often think of said that this century, with sea level rise, somewhere between 4 and 13 million people across the U.S. would have to move. If between 4 and 13 million people need to move, what happens to their banknotes? What happens to their businesses? What happens here depends very much on how we deal with our sea level issue. While you might think of this as a very isolated, remote place, it's very deeply connected to decisions that people make in the rest of the world. How we manage greenhouse gases, how we manage our climate. We'll have to restore the coast. 
if we wait 20, 30 years and sea level rise starts to accelerate, then it will be very, very difficult to, to rebuild land in Louisiana. But if we manage our climate in a way that keeps sea level rise low, then we have a lot of potential to rebuild a marsh. The nice thing about marshes is they have some ability to keep pace with sea level rise. Put marshes in place now, it's like an investment and it has an ability to provide returns years down the road.